share with you about emotional virtue. This is the definition. Emotional virtue, a lot of people ask me like, Sarah, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this. I made it up because I couldn't think of another word for it. I don't know what to call it. It's the it that we can't articulate, right? So emotional, we all get that. Virtue, probably you guys could not give me a definition. When I was in college, one of my professors said, when I was in Christian morality, he's like, tell everyone, name some virtues. And we were all uh, patients of the virtue. And then dead silence, right? <laughs> we're like, oops, <laughs> we obviously didn't get that in public high school. Um, so what is virtue? So right here, virtue is the habitual disposition to do good. Emotional virtue is ordering and controlling your emotions to give you the freedom to be happy. Freedom mm -hmm. is the discipline of desire so as to make the achievement of the good first possible and then effortless. How many of you guys know people who are just so dang awesome it looks effortless? How many of you have some phenomenal women? My mom is like, she's the vice president of student life at Benedictine. It's her 26th year as being BC's mom. And she just, I've never met someone who just, like, honestly puts other people first. Like, she just, um, just, you know, in all of it, right? And it was, she was so beautiful like that growing up. But now that I'm me, and I see her, it's just like, whoa. You know, and my dad's the most patient man in the world. You know, he has to be patient to live with my mom and I. Um, and he's the most patient man in the world. And I, you guys know people in your life who are just, like, just effortless. And that's virtue. We're going to get into it a little more, but like when it becomes second nature, you know, it's just so beautiful. So when you think about emotional virtue, I made it up. Think about emotions, passions, desires, feelings, all those things that are very hard to articulate. There's no bottle for it. And then think about virtue. Virtue. We're going to go through them later, right? Put them together. So these are the reasons why I want you guys to think about this. Virtue is kind of like the way that your body, okay, sports lovers, whoop. Anybody marathon runners? Okay, I have a friend who likes to marathon run. I think she smoked some serious crack. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I don't even like to walk 26 miles. I can't imagine running 26 miles. I don't know if I ever have walked 26 miles. Um, she loves to run, and she'll just go out and run like 13 miles for fun. Crazy, right? But here's the thing, her goal was to run a marathon. So she started at one mile, and then three miles, and then she kept going. Just like you're, when you're training your body to run a marathon, those first couple days of running two miles when you've never ran before, you're gonna find muscles you didn't, it's like, you know, it's hard to sit on the toilet for a couple days, right? There's like, you find all of these muscles you didn't know you had, like two days when I was in basketball, right? Okay, it hurts. But then my friend, that's the runner, how about mile six, mile eight? Effortless, right? 13 miles, no big deal, you know? To the point where, if she, after a couple months of doing that, if she missed a couple days of running, it hurt. Nod your head up and down if you're following me. God gave us sports not to be God. Sports are not God. God gave us sports to show us how to train our bodies and then to learn how to use that kind of blood, sweat, and tears to train our souls. God didn't give sports to be God. He gave it to us to learn how to discipline our bodies to show us how to discipline our souls in virtue. How awesome is that? Does our world know that? No. But I'm here to tell you, like, that's the point. So growing in virtue, we're going to get into that. But, oh my gosh, the goal is the marathon running, right? The goal is the state title. My boys, when we were in high school, the guys in my class, we were state football champs. Hallelujah, right? Like, it was the biggest thing that ever happened. It was awesome. They lived for it. I think they still live for it, right? Like, um, our tenure was a year ago, and it was still the main topic, right? But the point is, is they had a goal. They knew what they wanted to do. So my question to you guys is, what is your life goal? If football and badminton and marathon running are all games, what is the game of life? And what is the game of eternal life? So my question for you in the marathon, thinking about the running, these are the questions I want you guys to ask yourself. Who are you? What are you made of? What are you made for? And what has brought you to this moment, the good, the bad, and the ugly? I don't know about you guys, but I hated junior high. I hated it. I was bullied so bad. Uh, I remember one day I came home from school and I was like, Mom, like, I really wish that someone would just deck me, like the boys, and we could all be friends. Like someone, you know, the guys would like, I don't like you. Bam, and it was like, let's be friends. And I was like, I wish some girl would just deck me. It'd be over, right? Like, junior high is awful. And I'm working on this awesome talk that I'm gonna be giving on called True Sisterhood, which I should come back and give it to you. 
But anyway, that whole idea of junior high and then you go to high school and those, those groups just click off and then groups bully each other. And then you go to college and you've lost all trust in women and you're just trying to meet people for the first time. That's what I mean by the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some of this goal setting is gonna have to be looking at the past and saying, I need to heal from some of this. I need to look at what my insecurities are and come face to face with them so that I can answer these questions of what am I made for? Who am I? What do I wanna do with my life? Imagine you have a man calling me. No one ever asked these questions, ever. I didn't ask myself when I was in high school. It probably wasn't until like my sophomore year of college that I really think about who do I like? What do I want to be? I mean, I don't know. It took a long time to even know how to answer that question. But I want you to at least ask it. And I want you to think about what is the good, the bad, the ugly in your life? I mean, that's why it's so awesome that we have, you know, the gift of, you know, confession. And we have people to talk to and mentorship and counseling. Like God has so many things set up so that we can be healthy and be whole and then really answer these questions. Because here's, here's the goal. When that special person comes along and falls in love with you, who are they going to fall in love with? Remember, it's not about taking anymore. It's about giving. So when that person comes along and falls in love with you, who are they going to be falling in love with? Whole package, right? The best dating advice I ever received was from a priest on retreat. Anybody that says priests don't know what's up, they don't know what's up. Priests are amazing. I was in the confessional, it was retreat. I was in total retreat mode, sobbing. And, you know, retreat mode, right? Uh, and I was in there and I was in the confessional and I was, I was confessing the same things I'm talking about today. Like, I'm so tired of waiting. Like, what am I doing wrong? Like, God hates me. I don't have a boyfriend, right? Okay, so I was, I was doing the whole thing. And this priest, he goes, Sarah. And I was like, dang, he knows who I am. <laughs> I know who I'm like, Sarah. Like, you don't get away from this voice very fast. He's like, Sarah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to run towards Christ. I don't want you to look in any other direction. And when you're strong and you're whole and you've been healing and you're ready, I want you to glance to the side and see who's running next to you. And that's who you're supposed to be with. And I remember just like a ton of bricks falling off my shoulders. Because it no longer was about the perfection, perfect, perfectionistic people pleaser winning the game. It wasn't about that anymore. It was about me getting my life right with Christ, having an interior life, learning about what virtue is, figuring out how to live that out in my life, healing past relationships, healing, you know, all of a sudden it became things that I could actually do instead of sitting around and worrying and having anxiety and judging myself and coming down on myself and all the stuff that is completely a waste of time. But that's all we, like, that's all we concern ourselves with in the moment, right? He just totally flipped it on its head and it became a focus. Because what happens? Most of the time, like, women are like, yes, there's talk, I'm going to run towards Christ, all right. And then, like, cute boy walks by, and they're like, oh, cute boy, all right, and then they're like, come on, you know you love Jesus, let's go, <laughs> come on, and then you drag, and you drag, and you drag for about a year and a half, right, and then you realize this is not going to happen, and then you break up with them, and you're like, okay, refocus, right, or like the guys talk, typically the guys are like, okay, focus, Sarah's talk, like running toward the Lord, and they're just like tapping on the shoulder, and it's this cute girl, and they're just tapping, he's like, get away, I'm trying to focus. And he's like, no, you're right. I'm just going to go with you. Right? It's different. We are super distracted to guys. So note to self, don't be distracting to guys running to Jesus. Right? But that's what we do, you know? How much more fun is it to know that you can be in control of your relationship with our Lord? And you can be in control of your emotions. And you can be in control of your goals and growing your virtue. That's so freeing, is it not? It's like, I actually can do something about this instead of sitting around and worrying and all that. It's so beautiful. And here's the quote. This quote has, I don't know, it came out from the Holy Spirit through me at one point. It's been laminated and photocopied. And I have a girls in Scotland that have it up on their bulletin board in their, in their, in their sorority house. And I have people that have it on their dashboards and on their mirrors. And I've had women send it to me. And it's really beautiful. And this is what I want you to remember. Become the woman of your dreams, and you'll attract the man of your dreams. Become the woman of your dreams, and you'll attract the man of your dreams. Why? Because that guy is going to be so in love with the, with the you that you know who you are. The you that you know, he's going to be so in love with that. And chances are you're going to have a lot in common. Nod your head up and down if you're following me. In my case, 
I got the whole like running towards the Lord thing and like, you know, okay. And then like Andy passed me and I was like, I'm going with him. <laughs> right? I'm like, yes. You know, the man likes to fast. I'm like, I ah, know we're gonna need to be together because I need some help, right? Pick the man that's gonna take you to heaven, right? So the point is, become the woman of your dreams and you'll attract the man of your dreams. <laughs>